Ann williams Isom is the deputy mayor for Health and Human Services who has clocked many sleepless nights dealing with the migrant crisis. But, you know, I was very surprised this week when you said that the number of people coming into the city has dropped to 700. I was startled by that because it was, what, as high as... 2, as high as 4,000 at 4, 000. one point. Yes, at one point we were getting 4,000 people, right, a week. And so now it's down to about 700, which is a, a much, much different and much more able for us to manage that. So how does that affect city policy? Well, first of all, I want to really thank the, the Biden-Harris administration for the executive action that they've taken. And because of that action, we really have seen uh, the crossings at the border go down. And that's able, uh, has really allowed us to be able to manage this crisis in a, in a much better way. We've been able to e even sort of um, decrease the census. So in places like Randall's Island, we've been able to take down one of the tents. We'll be consolidating sites, and it just makes it much easier for us to manage the budget and everything else. So Randall telling you it took down a tent? We took down a tent. So there's less people there and there's less of a footprint. We'll be able to give them back a soccer field that was there so that the kids and the families can have, you know, this is a time of, of year when we go back to, to all of the schools and, and the activities that young people have. So we're going to be doing that with other places also. And that's having less of a census and having our census goes down allows us to do that. So one of those tents was about, what, 750 people. So where did those people go if you were able to take down the tent? So we still have, remember, we had up, up into 1.213 different sites. So we're able to see which ones are the sites where there's people are too crowded. So we still have our, our asylum seeker um, uh, help center, and we still have Roosevelt Island, uh, Roosevelt, Island Roosevelt, Roosevelt Hotel, where people come in. And so then we place them into the, the spots that we have. Are there any estimates as to how many of these, these hotels or shelters you'll be able to either consolidate or close? Well, that's the point, Marsha. As long as those numbers keep going down, and what we're also seeing is that, and for the past seven weeks, we've had less people coming in and more people exiting. So if that trend continues, we'll keep on looking at all the different sites throughout the five boroughs and consolidating them and trying to get the census down. So are these people actually leaving the city or finding housing, or are they ending up on the street in encampments? Definitely not ending up on the street. I thought you were going to say something different. So some people are staying here in New York City and finding places with families because we're, you know, almost three years into this now, so people yeah. have started to settle here. Some people are going to other parts of the United States. Some people have decided to go back to uh, their original country. But, you know, the mayor has been very um, clear that we don't want encampments and we certainly don't want anybody on the street and have been very proud that no families and children have been on the street. So school's going to start next week, and I wonder how prepared the school system is to deal with the children of migrants. Yeah. So I was saying that I love this time of the year in, you know, in New York City and everywhere else because this is the time where we'll have mil a million children here in New York City going back to school. And when I think about it, you know, we talk about kids who are in foster care. We talk about children who are in homeless, you know, shelters. We talk about migrants. They're all children, and they all need the same thing, have different, different types of specialized needs sometimes, whether it's about language, whether it's about mental health. But the New York City Public School is prepared. This will be our third um, school uh, session since they have been here. And so they'll be prepared with the teachers that they need, with the language services that they need, really connecting. You'll, I'm getting ready to go to a, a backpack event where a group of community um, folks and religious leaders are giving backpacks to children. So it's really a good time for New York City and for New Yorkers, too. Has it been difficult to get enough um, English as a second language teachers? I know that there's so many different <clears throat> languages that the migrants are speaking when they come in here. Have you been able to get the, the vast majority of people? Yeah, I think at the beginning, for sure, it was an issue at the beginning when we saw this surge of, of young people coming into the school system. But it's my understanding, and I'm sure that the chancellor will come back and, and talk about this himself, about 1,100 um, teachers that we have that are, are by dual language. And we know that while there's many languages, languages that the migrants speak, the majority of children speak Spanish, and so we think that we're covered in that area. I know that there's been an effort to get charities to participate in providing services for migrants. There's something called the Fund for new, Newest New Yorkers. 
Tell me about that and what's going on in terms of what the kinds of services they can provide. So one of the best things about New York City is our business community, our philanthropic community, and certainly our community-based organizations. And from the very beginning of this um, crisis, we've had people step up. And most recently, we've had the Robin Hood um, Foundation and New York Community Trust com create a fund so that smaller um, nonprofits and other new nonprofits have been doing this work can get more access to grant funds. But there have been many people who have stepped up who may not have even gotten funds because these are this is their community and they've really you know stepped up to support the migrant our new arrivals. Are they able to help them get jobs or find, get work papers? So this is this is the main thing. This is where the federal government we, you know we we need them to we're so happy for what they've done already but we need them to step up a little bit more. We know that throughout this whole country, there's so many jobs that, that people need and are available, but at least, and unless people have their work authorizations, then we we won't be able to connect them to jobs. So we do have um, our small business associations and some other cooperatives who are working to get people connected to work. We know that some people are working illegally and, you know, are doing that work in that way in order to support their family or to send money back. But that's something that we really would like uh, the federal government to work with us on, a decompression strategy, more um, funds to support um, the migrants that are here and definitely work authorizations. Is there any way to speed the work authorization up? I think that probably is ways. I've been amazed about what, what the White House has been able to do and I think that they're continuing to look at those things and I think that that would help cities enormously. One of the things that you've been working on that I'm interested in is the Women Forward program that the <clears throat> mayor has been proposing. Tell me about that. And has this been instrumental in getting more women into government, into, into jobs? So it's, um, it's um, I'm really happy that you brought that up. It's something that all of my sister deputy mayors and I have been working on, and it's everything from getting women connected to employment, to um, women who are victims of domestic violence, to women who are incarcerated. We really want New York City to be the friendliest city for women to be able to work and to thrive and to raise our children. And so we've been pretty, I think there were maybe be like 61 different initiatives and we've already checked off 47 of them in all of our different portfolios so we've been very proud of that of that work but you yourself have written very movingly about your own struggle to find your own voice and um, you know people telling you you shouldn't share too much of yourself you shouldn't talk about love or joy or things like that what was that struggle like for you? So um, I think many women, and I think maybe even particularly women of color, when you're coming into an environment and there's not a lot of people who look like you, leadership doesn't look like you look. And I think one of the great things about having um, this administration, where there's so many women of color, is that we can say you can be your authentic self. And so whether that is that you, I talk about my 94-year-old mom, I talk about my husband, I talk about my children, my community, my immigrant background, my, both of my parents were from Trinidad and Tobago, there were people who felt like that wasn't really professional for me to talk about those things in that environment. And it, I don't think you can really Did serve well. Did you feel well. squelched? Did you feel... Well, I don't think I... At the time, I kind of believed them. I was like, well, these people must be telling me the right thing, and so maybe this is the way that I need so to act. So you didn't talk about yourself? I didn't talk about myself, and I tried to, you know, act differently, and I was like, oh, I got locks in my hair, and oh, I got big earrings, and oh, I have all these things. And I think little by little what I realized is that the be you serve best when you're able to connect to the people and the things that you love and you're able to be your, your whatever that best version of yourself is. So given the fact that you had this going on, I wonder how you feel when you look at the Democratic ticket now where there's a woman as the presidential nominee of the Democratic Party who talks openly about joy and who talks about herself. I mean, at her convention speech, she said to her husband, I love you, Dougie. It was a very, <laughs> I mean, a personal moment. Right, right. How did you feel about that and seeing it? And did it may maybe empower you to feel better about yourself as well? So I get, I'm getting goosebumps with you um, asking me this question because I think it meant a lot because it kind of reaffirmed and confirmed that we can be powerful, we can be strong, we can be a commander in chief, and we can be funny and we can be loving and we can be a stepmom and a mom and all those different things and it was really special because I was able to share that with my two daughters and my son and for us to see this moment it feels like a historic and really proud moment okay we're gonna have to leave it right there for now but our conversation continues right after the show on our streaming channel CBS News New York
We're back with the bonus conversation with Deputy Mayor Ann Williams Isom. You know, most of your career, you've focused on service. I wonder what advice you would have for people who would also like to focus on service but don't want to live lives of poverty. Oh, uh, do we have we have to choose both no, of those no, things? No, but sometimes that happens. I mean, if you want to give of yourself, those aren't the highest paying jobs in the world. And I'm sure over the course of your career, you didn't have the highest paying job in the world either. I think that, I mean, you're, you're making a good point. Point, except for later on when I got into the work um, as being a CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone, there was, you know, a, a way for the board to be supportive so that we are really supporting nonprofits in the way and their leadership and their workers so that we can get the best and the brightest. But and I, you are paying more money for nonprofits now. That's right. And I, and I do think that, um, you know, I was trained as a lawyer and I practiced law for a while. And so I was making money there, but I wasn't really happy. So to your point, how do you kind of pay your dues? earlier in your career right. so that then when you're ready to get um, jobs you can move up that ladder. So you and your fellow deputy mayors are runners. Yes. And so when did you get into running? <laughs> How many marathons have you done? And are you going to run any other marathons like maybe this year? So hot off the presses. It's so funny that you say we're runners because it's kind of like, you know, we haven't been running that much. DM Fabian, I don't think has ever run a marathon before. Fabian's going to run? Fabian is running. With you? Maria is, DM Maria is, is running. Mira is running. Sheena, first deputy mayor Sheena She's is running, running. And I'm running. So the five of us are going to run New York City Marathon. Hot off the presses. All, this, used to, all together? This, well, we're all different. Uh, we're all, we all have different um, speeds and paces. I'm probably the oldest one of them, so I'll probably be coming over the finish line last. This will be my fifth marathon. Fifth? I'm turning 60. God so I, the last you. time I did it, I was 50. So I said I was going to do it again when I turned 60. So this is my gift to myself. And you, that's um, unbelievable. <laughs> have you been training a lot? I have been training, but you have to, I've been very careful because I want to get to the start line healthy. So I didn't train the way I did when I was 40, but I've been getting in my long runs and doing my uh, runs during the week. And actually it's been helping my stress level and it's been helping me to sleep better. So it's been a, a pretty joyous um, uh, effort. So, you know, you talked a lot about your mom who's 94. What does your mom do that makes you laugh? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. So our house phone is uh, on. On is needs to be fixed right now. So we got her her first cell phone this week. So before at I left, ninety four, she's going to use a cell phone for the first. Well, time? Th you know, listen. My uh, the kids were like, oh, she can try whatever. So today is my brother's anniversary. So before I left today, we were trying to teach her how to press the thing to talk to Siri to to dial the number. It was hilarious, and so we figured it out. But every, I mean, every day she's doing kind of funny stuff because she doesn't really. She has no filter and she doesn't care anymore but we, we were able to leave a message from my brother and I'm sure he's very concerned about what's going on in the house right now so changing topics what's your least favorite vegetable <laughs> my least favorite I don't really like vegetables a lot you don't as a runner you don't eat vegetables I didn't say I didn't eat them I'm just saying it's not like I have a favorite because and you don't like because I don't really what's like your vegetables. least favorite vegetable then maybe Brussels sprouts you don't like Brussels sprouts? <laughs> <laughs> what's your least favorite um, um, I eat a lot of vegetables. Oh, so they're all of you. Okay. So, you know, I, I like mean, spinach is my favorite. Okay. So are, are you afraid of spiders? Nope. No. Mm -mm. What are you afraid of? Rats. Rats. <laughs> you and the mayor. I don't know that he's, I don't, is he afraid of rats? I know he, he hates, hates rats. rats. He I don't, rats. I don't know that I hate them, but I know that I'm afraid of them. So last question. As summer unofficially comes to a close, well, how do you want to spend the long weekend? Will you get a long weekend? I will get a long weekend. My one of I have um, there are 13 grandchildren in my family wow. and one of my nieces is having a baby. And so she's wow. going to have a baby shower this weekend. I'm very excited. And then I have a long run. And of course, every weekend is church at Abyssinian Baptist Church. So Sunday morning I will be in church. So that's what I will be doing this Sounds weekend. Sounds like a wonderful weekend. Thank you for joining me and thank you at home for joining us as well.